All right, welcome everyone. My name is Conrad Woody. I'm the managing partner of the Washington office at Otters Benson. We're a global talent advisory firm and we warmly welcome you all to this powerful conversation called the importance of innovative leadership. And in celebrating and recognizing Black History Month, we brought three exceptional corporate leaders together to talk about this season of the world of work. This conversation will center on the cultural nuances and best practices of navigating the world of work. Uh, we'll focus on how to effectively build strategic relationship capital that will help accelerate your career. And you'll also hear excellent insights on corporate governance and pursuing your first board seat. So with that said, we welcome you all today. We want to thank our distinguished panel for joining us today. So I'm just gonna take a minute to introduce each of you. Then we're going to get in our conversation. So welcome everyone. So first up, we're so pleased to have Nelda Connors. Nelda is the founder and chief executive officer of Pine Grove Holdings, a privately held investment firm where she's overseen transactions representing over 300 million in enterprise value. Prior to that, she was the president and CEO of Atcor and has held multiple C-suite and executive leadership roles at Tyco, Eaton Corporation, and the Ford Motor Company. Nelda currently serves on the boards of Iconic, Baker Hughes, Otis Worldwide, Zebra Technologies, and Boston Scientific. Welcome. Glad to have you, Nelda. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. Excellent. Next up, we have Sean Cohen, who is the president of Bell Media. Canada's leading content creation company with premier assets in television, radio, radio, out of home advertising, and digital media. Prior, Sean was the chief growth officer and president for international for Nielsen and spent 15 years in senior level and C-suite roles at a &E Network. Sean is on the board of H&R Block. So glad to have you with us today, Sean. Thanks, Conrad. Good to be with you. Absolutely. And lastly, we have Denise Gray, who is the CEO of DKTN Consulting. She was most recently the head of external affairs and president of LG Energy Solutions Michigan Tech Center after a distinguished 30-year career in C-suite and senior executive roles at General Motors. Denise serves on the board of directors for Canadian National Railway, Railway and Chenier Energy. Denise, so glad that you have you here today. Glad to be here as well. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let's just jump right into our conversation. So I'd like to start with Nelda. As we sit here in 2024, the world of business and industry has dr drastically changed over the past few years. As you've observed this complexity, given your leadership role as an experienced corporate director and a former CEO, know that how would you advise our audience on how to effectively navigate this business environment as a Black executive? Well, thank you. And I appreciate the question. It's a very important one. And I think whether I would answer this as a Black executive or as a, a Black board member, you know, I bring my blackness with me, whichever role that it is. Um, so as uh, some others have uh, advised me along the way is you walk into the room, you are who you are. If there's an issue with it, let it be their issue, not yours. And so that's something that I've always um, embodied and, and, and thought about, uh, you know, when you, when you come into the room, you occupy the room the way and who you are and not try to be uh, something that you're not. So from that perspective, it is complex and especially became more complex with the recent Supreme Court rulings. And while I'm not uh, as uh, involved directly with uh, many uh, black executives 
um, other than more social and some um, uh, events or, or, or groups I'm associated with. Uh, what I can tell you, at least in my boards, um, the whole topic of DEI and how those companies are deciding, have decided to maintain what they started a few years ago in uh, the promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion, where, as you know, I, I understand that there's a lot of discussion on, do, is this still relevant? Well, yes, uh, it is still relevant. Um, I think um, the best companies still find it relevant and are keeping that conversation alive. Absolutely. And it is um, very relevant. And I always say that these things are worthy. And it takes leadership, it takes courage to navigate the complexity of this season in business. So I appreciate your thoughtful response, Nelda. I want to turn to Denise. Denise, you are a, an experienced executive and corporate director. Uh, you've been in roles where you managed and led teams and you've observed what works and you've seen what doesn't work in leading large complex organizations. But what comes up for me in this conversation about innovative leadership is the importance of managing one's career. You know, that continues to be a challenge for many people, especially folks that are at the mid-level and those that are at the senior level. So I'm curious, Denise, you know, what advice would you give women and Black executives on what's most important to consider in their career and leadership development journeys in 2024? Yeah, I would say that um, it is uh, it's complex, but I would also say that knowing yourself, mm. knowing what drives you, what gets you excited about getting to work every day, mm -hmm. I think uh, that self-awareness is most important. What am I good at? How can I contribute to the company, to the industry, to society? I think that, I think for me, that's been one of the most important things for me. And then knowing um, where my company is, you know, do they share those same kind of areas of enthusiasm, of passion? Mm -hmm. um, because quite frankly, um, it may not. And it may cause you to pause and to consider other opportunities that does mm -hmm. capture and want to continue to further drive in that area of, of passion, enthusiasm, uh, just relentless pursuit of, of 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 greatness in those areas. So, you know, I come from a technical background, and so my whole psyche is around solving problems. Yes. What must be done in order to make us get over the finish line? And that's a driving force for me. And quite frankly, whether it's in technology and medicine and finance and whatever the industry is, I think knowing that part of it. The second part of it is knowing where the industry is going, you know, right. is what I'm interested in, what the world is interested in. And I've worked in the technology and fuel efficiency and CO2 reduction and trying to make things better. And as I looked around, the industry was going, the, the world needed those kind of attributes as well. And so quite frankly, I've had to make some tough decisions in my career on where do I go and what do I do? And fortunately, those have all intersected very well in me saying, let me think about that opportunity. Uh, that opportunity has driven me to leave my, my home in Michigan, mm -hmm. working for an automotive company for over 30 years. And, and that was hard, leaving, mm -hmm. uh, leaving GM and moving to a startup company in California, doing the same kind of work that I wanted to do. And then even leaving that and going, Overseas, I lived in Austria for a couple of years working in the same industry because that company was moving in that direction. It so it aligned with what my desires and passions were. And and lastly, even coming back home and working for a Korean company, working for LG for over eight almost eight years, again, 
It was where my, my interests, my passion, what drove me every day intersected with what my job was. And from that, great, I think good things happened. Good things happened for me that I felt fulfilled in what I was doing. But I think the most important thing was the self-awareness, the global awareness of what was needed from a skill set. And then that evaluation of where is where I am today it's going to match what my, what my needs of passion and, and, and interest are. And then not being, not being afraid to make those moves to oh. other companies and other countries with other, other languages, quite frankly. Uh, many times I'm in meetings and I had to have an interpreter because I didn't know what they were saying. And mm -hmm. so just not, you know, having that courage to kind of follow those, those interests and, and, and pursue and pursue those no, to no end. No, that's fantastic. And, if I can just take a minute before we move on, Denise, what it sounds like is, especially given the complexity of business to what Nelda just shared with us. And it sounds like what you're saying is knowing yourself, spending time with yourself and understand what drives you. And then it appears that this relentless pursuit of skill set acquisition, you know, I think the reason why I asked you the question about the mid level is sometimes we may find ourselves in a position where we're doing one thing well, but we haven't added other competencies. And what it sounds like to kind of break through that is the courage to do something in the new and different. Is that sort of what you would advise people, if you will, Denise? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the courage, the, the self-awareness, and then, and, and I think because of those two attributes, mm. companies find you attractive yeah. because those are tough attributes to have in mm. your leadership. And mm. because you have that above and beyond what that company wants to do, but you've got that no matter where you stand, those right. are attributes I think that are needed and desired by various companies around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you. And as I'm grateful to be in this space of talent advisory, when I see a background resume, resume and narrative, and I said, well, that person was in Michigan and then they moved to Austria. I was like, wow, that's interesting. I'm curious about that. And so I'm glad that you have reinforced this need for courage in this season of the water work, which really dovetails into a question I wanna ask Sean. So Sean, one thing I appreciate about your narrative is that you've had excellent assignments and PL leadership roles, both here and abroad. You know, I think through those steps, I'd imagine that you've learned a fair amount about innovative and agile leadership in your rise to being the president of Bell Media, Media which is a very influential enterprise in Canada. You know, what comes up for me, Sean, is when you look back over those your career, when you look back over those steps, what would you tell your younger self about building effective personal and business relationships? Yeah, thanks for the question, Conrad. First, I want to just build on uh, some things that Nelda and, and, and mm -hmm. Denise said. That really resonated for me and in particular the you know we, and this is without respect or is not specifically to relationships but something i would have told my younger self mm -hmm. the importance of courage mm. uh safety was something that, that is really important and that's in uh, pursuing leadership challenges but it's also in in hiring uh and selecting kind of bringing people along it's imagination I, for me, I've always thought about it as a kind of leaning into discomfort, opting for discomfort, mm -hmm. not, not, uh, not just for the sake of discomfort, but uh, as you said, in the name of, uh, of acquiring new skills, new experiences, and, and kind of broadening out as a leader. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that kind of jumps out is also, for me, is loving what you do and being excellent at it. And those mm -hmm. are table stakes, those are basic, but it's really something we forget too often. It's like, if you love what you do, if you wake up every morning and can say, hey, I might do this if I didn't get paid for it, or even, even more so, hopefully, hey, I can't believe they're paying me for this, which some days we will, some days you won't, um, that's going to make you better at what you do. 
and um, you know, and to be excellent, you know, it's regardless of how small or how trivial or how kind of entry level or kind of, you know, low on the chain you're starting, whatever it is, if you can be excellent, um, because someone's watching you play or someone's watching you work for the first mm-hmm. time, that's going to be critical to long-term success. Specific to your network question and kind of developing relationships, for me, I think the first thing I would say, just kind of pivoting to that, I would say important to be really structured and partnerial internally in the places that you work in. So that's building relationships. If you're running a business unit, you're running a PL, and hopefully, like I said, you're being excellent at it. You're focused maniacally on growing long-term that business and doing the right thing for that business. But alongside that, you should be, or I, 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 this is what I would tell my younger self, really laser focused on building great relationship, re- partnerial relationships with your peers that are supportive, that you're, when you have time, when you have bandwidth, that you're focused, you're, you're focusing or tell, articulating to them, how can I help? Asking mm-hmm. them, how can I help? How can I help you be successful? Um, and, and, and more often than not saying yes, when they're asking for a hand. So that's kind of maybe the internal and being, and you want to be super structured, make sure that you're, you know, you're developing the same way that you develop a cadence with your team. It's developing, developing a cadence with peers who maybe don't uh, have an everyday reason to, uh, to relate with you. And I think um, external to your workplace, it's making building relationships a priority. Mm. It is at times it's a, there's a lot of bandwidth. It is, at times feels like another you know, job, another full-time job. But the message I would say, hey, it's an important one. And it's you know, building those relationships. Part of it is about finding people who are interested and invested in your success. Mm. And doing the opposite, right? Finding people who, you, who for whom you're interested in investing in their success. But I, I, again, again, sometimes along the way, um, it kind of gets lost because we all think, I think, you know, importantly, appropriately, that the main thing is the main thing. You got to drive your own business. Yes. But you, you know, maybe bounded only by sleep and sleep should sometimes lose if you want to be successful long term. You got to build those relationships internally and externally and find those people that are uh, that are willing to invest and those people, people for whom you are willing to invest. And then maybe the last thing I'll say and then I'll shut up, I promise, is um, it's going to be lonely. It's going to take a minute and there's going to be a fair bit of discomfort and creativity, but that's, you know, that's life and that's kind of the road to get there. And if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. No. Well, no, I appreciate the directness and the authenticity of your response. I, I want to go back to inside baseball and outside baseball, but you said something very important that I don't want the audience to miss. You said opting into discomfort. And I love the way you phrase that, especially given how competitive the world of work is. There are business, political, economic, and social concerns that really don't have much to do with us, but are part of our experience as professionals. So I just want to double tap on that, Sean. When you say opting into discomfort, what does that mean and how has that shown up in your life, if you will? Well, in, in many ways, I'm really inspired by what I think Denise just said on it. It's, it's a, and, and it's funny, it resonated with me, particularly because I'm in one of those roles now where I've, I've left my home. I'm a New Yorker. I, I was mm-hmm. in, you know, grew up in New York, lived there for 30 years, was successful in media, global media out, out of New York. And I upped and moved to Toronto, which isn't that far from a, you know, a, a mileage or, a, you know, it's only an hour and a half flight, but it's another country. Um, and I've got a young family and, you know, there, it's, it's, there's a lot of things that come along with that. It's a, it's a, a lovely place to do business. I've done business there for a long time, but it's, it's a very different arena, mm. uh, very specific. So, I, but I guess what I'd say to you is, um, I say to you all is, uh, in a funny way, in reflecting on uh, life as a person of color uh, and as a you know member of the black and brown community, in a lot of ways, um, in life generally for everyone, whether you're purple, green, it, it you know brown, white, wh- whatever, there's a lot of discomfort. 
right? Yeah. Like there's a lot of you, you, and uh, I think growing up, I got used to not being, you know, being in an environment where everyone else didn't look like me or thought differently or, you know, where I felt a little bit like an outsider. Mm-hmm. And along the way, you know, that feel that's pain, that can be painful, but at a certain point in your career, actually, especially in the kind of global business context, it becomes a little bit of a superpower or it becomes a little bit of something that you, you um, if you lean into that and you say, you know what? Okay. I'm used to being uncomfortable I'm, or used to not being the, like the same as everybody else. Um, there is this ability, you know, you, you hone your abilities to listen, to learn, to look at role models and kind of take stuff in quickly and then, and to adapt very quickly to new environments. And so there is that leaning into discomfort. They're like you wake up and you're in a boardroom in Tokyo or you're negotiating in Mumbai and you you just, you know, you kind of don't know whether it's the language or culturally, uh, you know, the right approach. And you kind of pick it up quickly. There's that that I've always appreciated about global business. But then there's also um, this sense that um, sometimes, to Denise's point, if you if there's things that you love, and you can you can pair that or you can do that in an environment that's different, that's additive, that makes you a little bit uncomfortable, not so uncomfortable that it's like painful every day. It, it, it's really like the the what it does for you from a from a skill set, credibility, been there, done that. And from a personal growth perspective is, you know, the growth you can get from it is pretty exponential. I love it. and and thank you so, for being tactical because that's important. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think there's some themes here. Um, you know, be, beyond the networking and uh, the you know honing your skill in the area that you find you know your functional area. If it's engineering, it's science, it's tech, um, and the like. Um, being mobile, taking those mm-hmm. risks. I think all of us have uh, on this panel have lived inter- internationally or have taken uh, the, the the role that probably you you know you, you had to think twice about, but you took it. But for the middle management in particular, and I can't emphasize this enough, unless you're in finance as a functional area, the sooner that an executive uh, or someone who wants to become an executive understands finance and understands how their functional area contributes financially to the company, the better off their career will be. Mm. No, that's critically important. And understanding that finance drives business, regardless. Of well, I always what- tell my, my, some of my mentors, mentees, everybody works for the financial organization in the company, even the CEO, right? So, you know, in a way, that's just, um, that's just business. No, I, and I love the directness of advice. I want to, before I go to the next question, which I want Nelda to start with, you know, Denise, you have a really cool story about long-term relationship management. You want to share with us on what happened and where that person ended up coming to be? Absolutely. So I worked at GM working on electric vehicles, which at that time, remind you, talking about uncomfortable, No, everybody says it'll never happen. It's a science project. It'll never happen. And but General Motors had a group of leaders who continued to push it for maybe it will happen. And I was here in Michigan, you know, the, the capital of automotive, quite frankly. And um, it gave me a chance. I was working in engineering. Uh, trying to get this battery, working globally with all kinds of suppliers. LG was one of the suppliers, as well as Panasonic and all the other companies. And here in Michigan, our governor was completely committed to how do we make, how do we make Michigan not just a company of old technology, but a company of new technology, how to bring in more investment dollars. Um, And so I worked, I'm in engineering, but I was able to support external affairs and government relations and investments and that kind of thing. Again, stepping outside of the bounds of engineering, but the whole holistic portion of getting a product from investments and capital into place. Back to that finance that you just talked about. <laughs> and so the governor happened to be at that point in time, Jennifer Granholm. 
Mm-hmm. And again, this was like 2007, 8, 9, 10 time frame. And she was working on bringing businesses into Michigan. And so one of those businesses was battery businesses. And so I worked with her to explain it to her, to help convince that G- GM had a good product, that my suppliers, LG, had a good product. And the in 2009, the uh, Recovery Act was put in place by D.C. that brought even more dollars in to do it. Fast forward 10 years later, Jennifer Granholm becomes the Secretary of Energy for the United States. I get tapped into becoming one of her advisors when it comes to energy policy for the United States. Again, 10 years with zero contact, but she remembered the collaboration we had 10 years prior. She remembered my contributions to that. And I was tapped to be on her advisory board and also tapped to be on the Joint Department of Energy and Transportation EV working group as well. Again, had zero contact, but I think back then she saw that I was completely committed to the technology. I understood the technology, understood the business aspects of it, the financial aspects of it, as well as bringing in new new investments here in the United States. And voila, 10 years later, get tapped. And now that relationship gets reconsummated to not just take Michigan to new levels when it comes to electric vehicles and infrastructure, but the entire United States and quite frankly, North America as well. Yeah, and I love the story, Denise, before we move on to the next question, because it talks about what Sean said, the value of being excellent. Because the governor's not going to remember you if you're not excellent, right? And then secondly, it's loving what you do. So I imagine that you brought a level of passion and energy to a project to where somebody remembered it 10 years later, if you will. And then lastly, with all of our careers, to know this point, preferably life is long. And make sure to be managing these relationships and doing well over a long period of time will yield results, especially given the complexity of the season. I, I thank you for sharing that, Denise. So, so moving on to a, to a topic that I think, you know, is important to all of us. You know, this is for the panel. I'd love to start with Nelda, then go to Sean, and then have Denise finish is, you know, as we've all seen, you know, the energy and the advocacy for divorce, diverse voices in the boardroom has changed in the last couple of years. You know, there's economic pressures, there's political pressures, there's business pressures, which informs how these organizations are making decisions. You know, starting with Nelda, you know, how would you advise the Black executives and others who are on this call that are looking to compete for their first seat on a corporate board? And what things should they keep in mind to find themselves in the swim lane of these opportunities? Yes, no, it's a, um, also a, a very interesting co- uh, question. Firstly, mm-hmm. you have to make sure that your organization supports it. Mm-hmm. Um, in my case, my very first board, I was Boston Scientific, and our uh, board actually thought that as part of the development of its executives, as the presidents of the various companies, we all should have at least one board that we would be a better executive to that company as well. And so, first of all, you know, ensure that that is something that your 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 company supports. But secondly, you need to figure out what does a company need. Mm-hmm. Um, so your board, your approach to an individual board might be different. You come with a battery of international experience, engineering, IT, what it, whatever your career has been. But for a board, the board has really four functions. Um, they are observing you know, the drive for results. It is providing resources for strategy uh, and the execution and challenging questioning strategy to make sure that you're making the the right um, investments on behalf of the shareholders. But it's also about um, understanding succession and ensuring that that company's executive 
wing is is built out and that the the bench strength e exists and it's also about risk management and keeping the company out of harm's way is there a strategy or something that the company might innocently or unintentionally do that that causes risk uh, to it and so from that lens of four you could position yourself as I have when I've been approached by different boards, what is what is it that I bring that maybe might be supportive of another director or the company's position or is very unique? And so knowing what that is that you bring, in some cases I'm the financial expert, some cases I'm not, some cases I'm coming with um, strategic or international experience where that voice is maybe not um, as strong or absent on the board. So you really need to understand what that board is looking for specifically. And yes, you're coming with all of these experiences, lifelong and professional, but to narrow your conversation uh, with those particular board opportunities about what's special about NELDA. Mm -hmm. um, as far as getting that first assignment or first board opportunity, really understand what the role of, of a board is. And in my case, I did uh, not because I knew that I would uh, ultimately come um, and become a, 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 a board director, a public company director. I did start in the private sector as a director. And uh, knowing some of the Robert's rules of how meetings are conducted, and um, you know the role of audit, the role of the committees, mm -hmm. um, all of those just structural things help you uh, to know. Yes, there's the fine line between being a director and being an executive, and you know when, how close can you get to that exact line? So um, those were some of the things that I I would. Um, encourage others to to consider as they're thinking about board service. And then more lastly, there's plenty of organizations like Auditors um, who, who are involved in um, developing as well as recruiting for boards. Um, many people think of, oh, if it's not Fortune 500, count me out. Um, there are thousands of companies who need that are publicly traded that need board directors. And so I've, um, even though I've been on large company boards along the way, I have, you know, I've, there's the smallest, I think market cap board I've, I've served on was like $2 billion. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot because the, the, um, the management team, the executive team um, may not have had the big company experiences and also the ability to bring in some of the newer thinking around comp committee or comp compensation or around nom and uh, nom and governance. And so I was able to bring that learning or those learnings from big company into small. So don't discount uh, that smaller companies need good talent as well on the on the board. No, that's a, that's great, Sean. I'm curious on what comes up for you. Well, first off, I'd say no, this is a tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> I would say um, first, before even the campaign, or the, uh, for me, it's about developing or establishing your bona fides, not just as a successful executive and leader, but also as a board member. Maybe that's for some people that will start with board roles that are maybe part of your job, whether that's in a joint venture context or on an investment. Uh, it might also, at the same time, it might be, be, um, might be nonprofit uh, endeavors externally. Nonprofit's very different, but it's still, you know, develop, developing a rhythm uh, and getting used to uh, being in a boardroom as a board member rather than an exec or leader presenting in that uh, meeting. I would, um, uh, Nelda said, talked about uh, a potential private uh, first step if you're ultimately thinking about public. I, you know, I had a similar experience where uh, my first board, AccuWeather, was is a private company, and it was a it was a great experience to uh, to learn. Private boards are different, and obviously, as Nelda alluded to, size of company, dynamics, founder ownership, all those things are all kind of inputs to this. But I think the first thing is you got to have the bona fides, you got to have the goods alongside the main thing, and being great as a leader 
It's also, you know, be uh, seasoned or capable and have some credibility as a board member. I think the, the second thing is uh, consistent with what Neil had to say. It's what you bring, you know, understanding what you bring and what you want in a board. So it's uh, what, do, what do you bring, whether that's global experience, you're the digital transformation agent, you are, you know, you bring financial expertise or risk management or a cyber or what have you. And then it's what you want. And I, I frequently, when I when people talk to me about boards, they don't have a great answer to what they want. Is it, you know, do you want to be on the other side of the table? Because uh, it's going to make you a better, a better leader, because that does happen. Uh, you know, do you want to develop a portfolio for the long term? Do you want the odds are I'm going to list out things and you probably most people will want most of them. But then specific to the company, are you you know, what kind of space are you worried about conflicts? You know, so on and so forth. Um, and then maybe the last thing, again, before you get to the campaign and designing a campaign and it is a multi year campaign that will for some folks will take a while. It's about diligence and mission alignment. So wow. diligence, like you've got your framework, you know what you want, you know what you bring, and but you've got really got to do great diligence. I think to nail this point, it's some of it is understanding the risk in, inherent in the company and the personal risk, therefore, to you. Uh, and then there is a personal brand, at least, uh, risk. And then, the, and then there's mission alignment. We've spent a lot of time today talking about the, the last 36 or so minutes, talking about loving what you do and, yeah. and, you know, being excellent. Well, you know, listen, this is not being a board member is very different than operating, but, or, and, uh, I should say it, uh, it's going to be important for you to enjoy the context, uh, and enjoy or be aligned with what the company is trying to get done, whether yeah. that's in a business context or whether that's even from a non-market kind of making the world a better place perspective, hopefully both. Those things are going to be important for like your own fulfillment and for your good function or, you know, for your performance on the board uh, over, over the time that you're there. No, I really, I really like all of that, Sean. This is, that's just very insightful. Denise, you've been through this a bunch of times. What's, uh, what's on your mind with respect to this topic? Yeah, I, you know, Nelda and Sean covered most uh, most of all the comments I was going to make. So I'll take it from a different lens. And two things, uh, three things I would say. Number one, I heard about being on a board as a female engineer when I was in my 20s as mm -hmm. an option for someone like me in the latter part of my career. So number one, organizations that are having, and it was through the Society of Women's Engineers Conference, they actually had a, um, uh, a segment on being on boards. And I never even thought about a board, didn't know what a board was. But in my 20s or early 30s, I actually sat in and I go, huh, that could be a part of my uh, career opportunities in the latter part of my year. So I had it in the back of my mind as, an opportunity. And I think for underrepresented folk, women, Black Americans, we need to know that this board roles could be a part of our career if we choose. That's number one. So I my radar was up a little bit based on something I heard in my 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, I would say that um, having, you know, being good at your craft, back to what Sean mentioned, Nelda mentioned early, being excellent at what you do is what some boards are going to be looking for. Uh, when we put together, when we're looking for new board members, we go, what skill sets are we looking for? Because we may have, we may be overindulged in finance or, or CEO leadership, and we may need some technology or may need some government relations. And so if you're being good at what you're doing, I think is important and let that highlight itself. In fact, for me, I think that was a part of the reason why I got solicited mm. to be on a board because of the work that I was in, the areas that I was exposed to. It was new technology. Uh, it was at in new companies and new areas. And I think that's what brought me to a number of the boards that I sat on. The third thing I would say is, um, and, and you'd be surprised because I work on batteries, right? So everybody thinks everything I do has to be in batteries. Well, the answer is 
I'm on a railroad company's board. Right. Right. And so when I talk to the, 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 the membership committee, they I go, well, why do you want me here? I just wanted to hear what they wanted to say back to what Nelda said. And she's and he said, Denise, you worked on battery electric, you worked on compressed natural gas, you've worked on hydrogen, because at GM, you had to work on all of those. And quite frankly, the railroad has to change. And we're going to be looking at what technology should we go into in the future. And with your diversity of that kind of background, we want you to be on the on the board. And I go, awesome, sign me up. <laughs> and the other one, the uh, Chenier Energy is a liquefied natural gas company. Again, gas company. Denise, you're doing electrification. Why would you be on a gas company? Because the processes and the technology they use to do liquefaction is amazing. So what I wanted to say is don't, uh, for me, people look at you not just because I worked on batteries. So every single board I'm going to be on is a battery board. Quite frankly, to the contrary, while I was working, I couldn't be on a battery board because it was a conflict of interest. I had to work on something outside of the battery area, but I found where my skill set could still be applicable. So again, because I work on batteries doesn't mean I don't know anything else but batteries. I know a lot of stuff and I love learning about a lot of stuff. So make sure that you recognize and put all of the things that you've worked on on your board bio because people mm -hmm. are looking for different things. So don't take for granted that they're looking for what you're working on right now. The last thing I would say is it is complex right now because of all of the equal rights and all of this other stuff that people are saying legally is going to be discoverable if you put diversity stuff in place. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, it's made it harder because there are boards who said, we recognize and value, and not, not only boards, but the shareholders say, mm -hmm. we recognize diversity. And because with diversity becomes greater, larger opportunities for us to think about what we should do, where we should go, and we want the diversity of thought. And so that is now playing in the background. But mm -hmm. guess what, folks? We've always had things up against us, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it ain't nothing new. And quite frankly, we'll get through this as well because you're good at what you do. You've been exposed to what you do. People know that what you're doing. And so what you do will be able to help to push and maybe balance this. I can't put diversity in my, 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 my information anymore because people are getting upset about it. People and shareholders know that having a diverse group of people put together to come up with great solutions will always be better than having a homogeneous, everybody's doing groupthink kind of opportunity. So mm -hmm. yep, we know it's gonna be hard, but guess what? We've got to keep pushing. The last thing, and I'm sorry, I've taken too long. The last thing is your network. I was told, so I learned about boards maybe, like I said, decades ago, but a leader that I was, uh, one of my prior CEOs, uh, I met up with after about eight years of zero contact. And he met up with me because he was in this industry and he wanted to know what was happening with industries, what technology, Denise, what's going on with you? And he came to me and he said two things. Number one, after getting my two minute, what's been happening with me over the last eight years, he said, number one, you could be an excellent board member. That's what he mm -hmm. said. So put in mind, he's going to be my reference, by the way. Mm -hmm. And number two, he said, you can do just as well uh, financially being a board member than the company that you're stinging it with right now. And then mm -hmm. thirdly, he said, a lot of the board member slates to be considered come because of other people that are on boards putting their names mm -hmm. in. So mm -hmm. not from uh, search companies, yeah. but mm -hmm. from people nominating people they know. Yes. He said, quite frankly, that's where a lot of the names come from. So leverage the people that you've worked with in the past. Let them know that you're interested in being a board member and saying, hey, keep my name on top of mine. So if a board position comes up in your network, Think about me. And guess what? That ends up being he and from his perspective, 
and this is private companies and public companies, he said that's probably over 50% of the people that are on boards come from people who know people, and that's how their name got into consideration for those board seats. So I'll, I'll stop talking now. And I appreciate your passion. And this is why it's so important to have these conversations and why we need to be honest, thoughtful, and supportive of creating the reality that we want to see. And this, all three of your, your comments go directly to providing information equity. And so as we transition into the very last question, I'd like to invite the audience to type their question in the chat or type it in the Q&A box so that we can answer, get your question answered after this final question. So, you know, Nelda, Sean, Denise, this has been a fantastic, very substantive, tactical, actionable conversation. As we close, given our theme is the importance of innovative leadership. I would like each of you to share what your one piece of advice for the folks in the room, folks in the audience, on how you can create the change that we want to see in the world of business for Black executives and those alike. No, they want you to start with that. So creating change is always hard, right? Mm -hmm. But in this world of transformation, right, to use a, uh, to coin that, that what's going on in the world, you have to do that same thing for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about my, you know, I, I was an engineer, mechanical engineer, and I had a mentor who said you could do more. Ooh. And around that time is when I started to understand uh, finance and the role of finance in developing products and products that people want to buy and, and that whole, um, the whole lineage of, of how business is done. But beyond that, then to have a career in automotive, it started in automotive, and then go take the, the leap into the diversified industrials and, and around the world in both cases, and then take a conscientious decision to prepare myself for creating a, a firm of my own. It wasn't just steps that I took without thought, without preparation. And no matter what your where your career takes you, just the thought and the preparation, and you know I'm going to be the man or I want to be my own man. Um, you know it, it, it's no joke to have employees and to have to pay them, and you know it's one thing to only have to feed yourself or your family, but um, so as you to you know, traverse your career, whatever that is, wherever that's taking you, it's a it's a a part of that is what a company may give you in terms of your learning, your experience, but what you do for yourself on the outside independently in getting mm -hmm. yourself ready. I can't uh, you know describe how important that element is equally is in preparing you for your career and where you want to go in terms of being innovative and transforming it. I love that. Sean, what's coming up for you? Uh, maybe building on the the uh, the extensive uh, or many references to courage, it's uh, creating changes requires creativity and boldness. Mm. Um, requires an imagination, uh, whether that's, you know, imagining what a challenge, turning a challenge into an opportunity, whether that's imagining what a different geographic construct could look like, whether that's an imagining, you know, what a role could turn into, uh, I would say, you know, you, you can't make change without, without some creativity. And maybe the second thing I would say is we're talking a lot about getting on the board track on, you know, uh, kind of running or designing and running a campaign to get on a board track. But I, I would say I want to impress on no matter where people are in their career journey, that as part of this and partially because of good karma and just putting things out in the universe, but mm -hmm. partially also because it's a good muscle to develop, uh, peer mentoring and uh, mentoring folks uh, 
uh, junior and earlier in their career, no matter where you are in this journey, it's, it's, it's critical. And it's ultimately, if you think about what being a board member is, everyone kind of, you know, I think there's some things we can agree on. As a board member, you're, uh, depending upon the company, you're a fiduciary, you have provide oversight, you provide advice. Mm. That's what you do. You're providing advice to a management team. You're not operating. And so to me, you can even think of uh, mentoring peers or mentoring folks that are junior, you know, investing in other people's development. You can think of that as, uh, as building blocks to ultimately being a board member. I like to think of it as, again, karmically rewarding and the right thing to do in the universe. And it's all part of, you know, it's a pay it forward, but it's also an important step in you becoming a, a truly quality advisor uh, of, of people, of leaders, of companies. Fascinating. I love the phrase karmically rewarding. I think I'm going to take that one back with me. But Denise, what are your no, thoughts? I was, no, I would <laughs> say um, I, I've become Sean and Nelda fans big time. You all are awesome. <laughs> Uh, I would say, and I'll just kind of from a different, just a slightly different lens, and um, I would say, be you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know it's, you know, kind of everybody's saying, be your authentic you all the time. But what I'm saying is, I know I come from very humble beginnings. My mom and dad did not go to college. They mm -hmm. were laborers. Mom worked at a plant until she was in her 60s. Dad did construction work until he was, you know, early 70s, if you will. So look, some hardworking folk that I come from. And their whole goal was that um, you work hard every day. Nothing's given to you. You earn what you get and, uh, and get as much as you possibly can. Mm. Uh, learn and be who you are in that support of family and, and church and, and your faith and all of that kind of comes all together. In fact, I have a hard time separating all of those. My husband's an engineer and he's good at compartmentalizing things, but me, it's all one big glob of here I am and I am going to be honest. I'm going to have integrity. I'm going to work hard every day. I'm going to listen to what you say. I'm going to trust what you say until I can't trust you anymore. And I'm going to tell you, I can't trust you anymore. So tell me why I should trust you now, if you will. But I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do that because, quite frankly, my family's looking at me. Mm. My mama's looking at me. My Lord's looking at me. And so what mm -hmm. I do is well beyond what these companies are asking me to do. I'm doing it because it's me. Yes. And so... And companies will, they want that. They want good, high, especially boards. Oh my goodness. Integrity, honesty, clarity, transparency, all of those are a part of being on a public board or any board that's representing the shareholders, looking for growth of that company, because we want to make sure this company is here for the next hundred years and return on folks' investments. And so they're looking for people who've got charge and they're going to push forward. But quite frankly, that's what you all bring anyway. Quite frankly, from our heritage, we bring that hard work in. We're going to work every day and we're going to keep working until we can't work. But in a way that is benefiting you, benefiting your family, benefiting the shareholders. And so I would say from that core of who you are, let it be known because that's who you are and that's what you're going to bring every single day that you get on on that floor if you will so those are my comments on what i think from the from a core perspective bring your core because your core is good and your core is hard working if you will i love that and, and and if i can speak on behalf of myself our ceo ken and kincaid and the broader audris berenson we are grateful to each of you Denise, Nelda, and Sean for being the change we want to see. And so we're going to ask one to two questions. I'm going to address the first one to Nelda and the second to Sean and Denise before we wrap up. For Nelda, what are the challenges that women and other Black board members face when joining public and private boards? How do you make sure you're being heard? What are your thoughts on that briefly, Nada? I think by the time you get to a point where you're being invited to a board, that, at least in my experience, is not the, the question mm. um, being invited in. By 
of being nominated and going, at least being on the slate, being nominated, and then ultimately being um, asked to join the board in a way by definition, some of the the concern that the the um, person who asked the question, a lot of that has gone away. So now it's about performing and fit and finding your voice on the board and contributing, um, whether it's coming prepared and having that question initially understood, you know, how you might go through orientation or outside, again, outside work to get, to make yourself a better board member, whether it's going to a facility or an R&D center or something on your own um, in preparation for those board meetings so that you can catch up to what the conversation in the room all is and has been. Uh, I think those are those would be my uh, ideas on getting prepared for um, for the for the board uh, rather than um, by as, as again, the invitation to join uh, speaks highly more highly than uh, the first day at work, if you will. Well, I love that. Thank you for your directness. Um, Sean and Denise, talk with us briefly about the due diligence you do when you're being presented with the board opportunity to determine whether it's an alignment or not. Denise, you want to go first? Sh sure. Um, I, think, I think we had talked about making sure that what the company's product is, um, is aligned with where your interests are. And I've actually turned down opportunities to be on boards because that product just didn't kind of excite me. And so um, so I think that's important uh, to take to make sure that the alignment of the, the board's product um, and uh, is, is aligned with what your interest is. The second one, and maybe it's even more important, is the board culture itself and the company culture itself. Again, yeah. um, I... Uh, high integrity, high honesty, transparency, all those great things that the board's culture as well as the company's culture are in line with what your culture is when it comes to those aspects. So I'll just stop there with those two those two topics there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll build on, sorry, I'll, I'll build on that and say maybe three, four things. One is uh, it's about understanding the impact that you think you can have and they, they are expecting you to have, just making sure that those are in alignment. Uh, you know, if they want a financial expert and you're not a financial expert, well, you know, some of this, it isn't, it isn't really a fake till you make scenario. You got to make sure there's alignment there. Second is um, aligned with Den what Denise was saying. It's a little bit of the Pittsburgh airport test. Would you, if you were stranded and forgive me, anyone that's from Pittsburgh, but if you're stranded in the Pittsburgh airport for 10 hours with somebody, would you, and you're doing this with your other board members and with the leadership team, would you have stuff to talk about? Would you enjoy it? You're going to spend, it's just like work. You're going to spend a lot of time with these people. So it's, you got to feel like you're stimulated. You enjoy, you buy them, you, you enjoy their company. You think you can get stuff done together. It's to the, Denise, I think, talked a little bit about culture. The third thing I'd be looking at is just the viability and the risk of the company. Mm -hmm. Do you think the company's going to be successful? You know, and that's not doesn't just speak to your dot your your kind of how lucrative it'll be. It's just you know, is it going to be successful? Is it a high risk vehicle? Is their personal brand risk to you? And then the fourth, uh, maybe a little repetitive, is value and mission alignment. Not just about the product which we talked about, but also you know, if they if there are values in the company that they espouse, if they're really passionate about ESG, if there if there are some things that they're doing to invest in the community, if those are extra aligned with what make you tick or your, your core values, that's going to help you bring yourself and be excited to be in the boardroom even more so. So those are just a couple of things of the diligence of it. Love that. Nada, Sean, Denise, we thank you. And we thank all the participants. Over 125 people registered for this conversation. You all will get a copy of this presentation. And we thank all of you on behalf of our team at Azure Benson for creating change in this season of the World of Work. Thank you all. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Indeed.